Hello, welcome to the monthly teaching video of Safe Space Community for Asians. SSC seeks to equip the body of Christ with basic mental health literacy from the medical, psychological, spiritual, and relation perspectives by integrating psychology and theology. This is session number 11. I am Dr. Edmund Ng, a licensed psychotherapist, and I am your facilitator in SSC. The title of today's topic is Helping Sexually Abused Children. You will learn, first of all, what are the common types of child sexual abuse? Then what are the immediate consequences of child sexual abuse? How do you then respond to the child after disclosure of the incident? And what are some of the parental preventive strategies that parents should be aware of? Then we will look at some of the long-term repercussions of child sexual abuse before considering the psycho-spiritual interventions. And I will end by giving you some Bible verses that you can use to minister to those who are sexually abused. So let's start at looking at the common types of child sexual abuse. First of all, there is physical abuse. This includes fondling, masturbation, oral genital contact, or penetration with a child. Then there is the non-contact abuse, such as showing explicit materials or exposing oneself to a child and engaging in sexual conversations. Of course, there is the online sexual exploitation and this includes the sharing or soliciting explicit materials of sexual conversations. And very common is child pornography. This involves the creation, distribution, or possession of explicit sexual material using photos, videos, or written content. And there is widespread sex trafficking this involves recruiting, transporting, harboring, or receiving children for sexual exploitation. Within the family, there is incest. This involves sexual abuse, often perpetrated by a family member or relative. Then there is commercial sexual exploitation, such as using children in prostitution or pornography. There's, of course, also widespread sexual harassment involving children and adults. This includes inappropriate sexual comments, advances, or behaviors directed at the child, including having the child to pose, undress, or perform in a sexual way just for fun. And in some countries, there are exploitative child marriages such as forcing a child into marriage for sexual activities. It is estimated that 10 to 20% of children are sexually abused before they reach the age of 18. So what are the immediate consequences of child sexual abuse? Of course, there is terror involved. Terror is this constant sense of fear in anticipation of future abuses. Then what is the sexual responsiveness of the child? Often there is sexual trauma as a result of the child's own sexual arousal to the abusive sexual behavior of the offender. And this may be accompanied by distorted offender identification. What is distorted offender identification? Rather than seeing the offender as guilty and responsible for the sexual misbehavior, the child identifies with the positive physical or personality characteristics of the offender. On the other hand, there can also be distorted victim identification. Rather than seeing themselves as the innocent victim, the child identifies themselves as the guilty person to be blamed for the abuse. 
Sometimes there is amnesia. Amnesia refers to a loss of memory of the facts and experience of the sexual abuse. Unlike dementia, amnesia does not affect the person's judgment, personality, or identity. The victim only has trouble informing memories of the abuse amidst displaying confusion and disorientation. This is to prevent the victim from being overwhelmed by what took place. In fact, amnesia is a very intense form of the natural defense mechanism of denial. This can also be accompanied by dissociation. Besides memory loss, there is also the feeling of disconnection with oneself or a blurred sense of identity. The victim, in fact, perceives the people and the things around them as distorted or unreal. This also serves to remove oneself from the trauma of the sexual abuse so that one does not feel the pain or the terror. And there is trauma escalation for having to keep secret the abuse. The child who has to keep secret the sexual abuse under threat or under shame will experience increased trauma. And there will be sudden emotional and behavior changes. This include erratic mood swings, anxiety, withdrawal, insomnia, nightmares, engaging in self-harming or risky behaviors. There could be changes in relationships. This includes difficulty in trusting others, avoidance of physical contact or intimacy, over-attachment to certain people, or just seeking inappropriate attention. There may be regression. Regression is displaying various behaviors typical of a much younger age, such as bedwetting or thumb sucking. Then there can be a sense of negative self-concept. This is negative body image or discomfort with one's own body. What are the physical symptoms? There may be unexplained pain or discomfort in the genital area or sexual health issues such as sexually transmitted infections. There will be fears and avoidance, fear of specific places, people, fear of situations associated with the abuse and avoidance of situations that could trigger memories or emotions related to the abuse. And finally, there can be flashbacks. Flashbacks are experiencing intrusive memories triggered off by sight, sound, smell, or situations reminiscent of the abuse. So how do we respond to the child after disclosure of the incident? If the abuse is ongoing or the child is in immediate danger, we need to prioritize safety. If necessary, contact the relevant authorities for child protection. Do not blame the child, but believe in the child. Tell them it's not your fault. Check with a medical doctor if there is a need for medical examination and instruct the child to tell you immediately if the offender attempts sexual contact again. Then assure the child that you will continue to help him or help her. Do not pressure the child to talk about the incident and respond to what is expressed with a calm, non-judgmental and empathetic voice saying, I'm sorry this happened to you. Affirm that it is right for the child to tell, but at the same time, respect the privacy of the child in not wanting to tell anyone else. Do not promise the child secrecy as you may need to involve other adults to ensure their safety and well-being. Parents should inform the child's siblings that something has happened 
without disclosing too much details. Ensure that all children in the family are given enough information to protect themselves from the offender. Parents or caregivers should encourage the child to continue with their regular routine around the house so that there are not too many changes. And parents ought to talk over the incident with a therapist, a counsellor or pastor, but not in front of the child or the children. And depending on the situation, you may need to involve the law enforcement to ensure that appropriate legal actions are taken. So what are some of the parental prevention strategies that parents should be aware of? Some of our teachings or instructions to our children can contribute to making them easy victims to sexual abuse. For example, when we keep on telling them, respect your elders, if an adult tells you to do something, just do it, the charm must also be taught that when they are asked to violate God's values or their own conscience, they must not do it. Or we tell them, learn to keep secrets. A child should be taught that if an adult tells them not to tell anyone what he's doing, then they should tell because it is probably something wrong. And parents also often tell the children, Children should be only seen and not heard. We should always encourage the child to verbalize their thoughts and feelings and listen to them. This is part of our caring and nurturing for them. And it's often told that children should not talk about their sexual matters. If sexual matters are taboo, then a child will not tell an adult even when they are molested. A child's understanding of healthy sexuality is important for them to recognize what is sexual abuse. And then we ought to teach kids on offender profile so that they are more aware of any potential abuse by these people. Such people are usually very charming, extremely helpful, always prefers the company of children, they have unusual fondness to tickle or handle children roughly, and they often have insider status into the family. Now let us look at some of the long-term repercussions of child sexual abuse for that person as they grow into an adult. First, there can be symptoms of self-abusive behaviors. The child who feels bad because of guilt and feeling responsible may begin to act bad, leading to problems in the adulthood such as alcohol and drug abuse, domestic and criminal violence, antisocial behavior, and so on. There can be problems with sexualized behaviors. The person may display overly sexualized behaviors, inappropriate or beyond their age and development level. Then there will be relationship problems. The child may develop difficulties in forming and maintaining intimate and trusting relationships with others later in life. They may also have sexual difficulties, weak boundaries, like they can't say no, expectation of abandonment, isolation, excessively clingy to certain people. Then, there may be psychological problems in adulthood. This includes low self-esteem, damaged goods syndrome, like I'm always dirty, self-blame, shame, guilt, powerlessness, depression, anger and irritability, suicidal thoughts, and difficulty in expressing emotions. They may have life skill problems, this includes the inability to nurture and care for oneself. They can become abusive to other children or on the other hand, overprotective as a parent. Then they may have academic or occupational problems. 
This includes poor academic or job performance due to prolonged emotional distress. Now let us look at some of the psycho-spiritual interventions that we can adopt. First of all, the child must ventilate his or her feelings about the sexual trauma in relation to the guilt and shame. Feelings towards the perpetrator, feelings towards the self and the parents, as well as the reactions of the siblings, peers and people in the community. Then the focus should shift to the parent-child, interfamilia, and boy-girl relationships, to the sexuality issues and abuse of power issues involving gender, conflict resolution, and problem solving. There may also be a need to troubleshoot the other symptoms. For example, if depression surfaces, this must first be attended to as a separate problem. And you can refer to our SSC teaching video V01 on addressing depression to learn more about this. Now EMDR, standing for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy, is a circular psychological technique recognized by WHO as the most effective approach to addressing sexual trauma. The fallen Christian approach is the closest equivalent to the EMDR. This is called the Memory Reframing Psychotherapy or MRP. As the immediate consequences and long-term repercussions of child sexual abuse are rooted in the past trauma, the symptoms are in fact the manifestations of the defense mechanism that prevent the memories of the past trauma from surfacing. MRP is a psychodynamic technique to restructure the negative memories of the past trauma to something positive so that the use of defense mechanisms becomes unnecessary. Now, the neuroscience aspects of MRP. Unresolved past traumatic events are stored in our memories. The persistent change in the strength of the connections is termed as synaptic plasticity. Neurons that fire together, wire together. These past toxic memories can be restructured through the creation of healthy reparative memories as alternative routes for the synapses to travel on when a particular trauma memory is triggered. The good news is that we can create the healthy alternative routes without reliving those events in real life. Neuroscience researchers have found that mental imagery can change our multi-sensory perceptions. In other words, our imagination can create reality at the neuronal level. To be effective, unresolved trauma memory reframing through imagery has to be experienced as real as possible. The experiencing is key for effectiveness. And this is the process. Step one, psychoeducate the person to be more aware of the immediate and long-term symptoms, as well as how they react in the face of a potential trigger to the child sexual abuse incident in the past. Step number two, get the client to relax, close the eyes, and imagine walking into the memories of the past sexual abuse. Step three, zero into the most traumatic scene of the incident. We call this the governing scene. Step four, lead the client to re-experience the governing scene as real as possible and verbalize the sequence and emotions embedded in the memory. Step five, ask the client to imagine bringing into the governing scene someone 
and preferably Jesus Christ. Who can rescue and comfort him from his abuse incident? The rescue means this person is able to change the outcome of the imaging incident to a favorable one. And step six, we need to reinforce the favorable memory by asking the client to verbalize the new emotions now experienced by him. And finally, step seven, bring the client back to awareness and debrief on what has taken place. The purpose is to repair the trauma of his original experience of the abuse to create through imagery a favorable memory out of the same past scene as an alternative route for the memory synapses to travel. And you can learn more about this from our SSC teaching video V04 on resolving hidden shame. Now, finally, I would like to end by giving you some relevant Bible verses that you can use to minister to those who are sexually abused. First of all, 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Romans 8.1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Isaiah 54, 4. Do not be afraid. You will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth. Psalms 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. Psalms 1473, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up in their wounds. So we have come to the end of this month's teaching video. I wish to thank you for watching our SSC series. This is session number 11 and the topic is helping sexually abused children. To receive our latest free monthly teaching videos, case study blogs, emails, pro bono counseling sessions, and links to our weekly conversations for sharing and consultations, kindly subscribe to our SSC website at www.safespacecom.org. I look forward to seeing you again. Bye for now.